one of the reasons we chose it is because we have a whole bunch of windows that open up on either side of the boat um, and we get a tremendous breeze when we're out on the water. So we don't have to have, even in 90 degrees, we don't need air conditioning. We just open up the windows. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 217 with The Sailboat. Allie and Galen are the Sailbums, who are a musical duo from Maine who live and travel the eastern seaboard on their 37-foot Endeavor sailboat. In this interview, we talk about what it's like to be a musical performer while traveling on a boat, how Allie and Galen make their living while living full-time on the boat, and just generally about why the nomadic lifestyle is so appealing to them and why they continue to seek it out. It's a really fun conversation, and I hope you stick around. I want to tell you about something that I think will be super helpful as you plan, design, and build your tiny house. Tiny House Decisions is the guide that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. It comes in three different packages to help you on your unique tiny house journey. And if you're struggling to just figure out the systems for your tiny house, you know, like how you're going to heat it, how you're going to plumb it, you know, what construction technique are you going to use, like sips or stick framing or steel framing. Tiny House Decisions will take you through all these processes systematically and help you come up with a design that works for you. Right now, I'm offering 20% off any package of Tiny House Decisions. For listeners of the show, you can head over to thetinyhouse.net slash THD to learn more and use the coupon code TINY at checkout for 20% off any package. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash THD and use the coupon code TINY for 20% off. All right, I am here with Allie and Galen from the Sailbums. Allie and Galen are the Sailbums, a musical duo from Maine who live and travel the eastern seaboard on their 37-foot Endeavor sailboat. They've been together for more than 20 years and playing music together for around 24. And in October of 2020, they jumped on the sailboat they'd been working on for nearly three years and never looked back. They fell in love with the ocean, traveling, wandering aimlessly, and experiencing life from a minimalist, low-cost, and flexible perspective. Ali and Galen, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so your timing couldn't have been better because I feel like in October of 2020, there were a lot of people who were desperate to, to get the heck out of wherever they were, but it was hard to buy vans. I'm sure it was hard to buy sailboats. Um, but you had been working on your boat for three years. So ca- can you kind of give us the the more extended version of, of the story in your bio? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, we uh, we bought our boat knowing that it was going to be a fixer upper. Mm-hmm. And we would have to in the in the boating world, um, it's called a refit. You have to mm-hmm. like replace a lot of the, the, the systems and and things like that to make your seaworthy. Uh, we thought, we thought naive. Uh, we thought it was going to be like a, oh, maybe what, a two month process. You think? Oh, I th- I think we probably thought it was going to take the better part of a year, but definitely not more than that. You know? Yeah. Not three. That's not crazy. Three. <laughs> not three. We kept everybody kept asking us. So when's it going to be ready? And we kept oh, a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, not so much. Three years later, we were finally done, and we were in the middle of the pandemic, of course, and there were a lot of people who didn't want to get on their boats and go at that point in time. They thought it wasn't safe. You need Mm. to stay home. You need to be protected. But the way we thought of it, we're going to be on the boat 95% of the time, quarantined on our own. It's probably even safer to be on the boat than it is to be at home and going out and doing errands Mm -hmm. all the time. So we just took the leap. I have to agree with you. Yeah, it couldn't have been a better time to do it, really. And it also meant that places weren't so congested and the cost of boating went down considerably. Like we were able to stay at certain marinas mm. and things like that for a lot less because they were just desperate for any customer. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, it seems like a little bit counterintuitive or, or opposite of, of maybe like tiny houses and vans. I feel like the demand exploded, campsites were full, that kind of stuff. Um Did you find that, or are you finding now that there's kind of a, a I guess backlash isn't the right word, but uh, pent up demand for 
anchor spots, moorings, services, all those kinds of things? I think I think that's a correct. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with that statement. Right now, though, it's it's hard to tell because we're in the middle of the spring migration of people coming uh-huh. north from like Florida, South Carolina, and people that were in the Bahamas want to come up and cruise on the like the okay. Chesapeake. Yeah. Where it's not so hot. And up to Maine where, where we were from. But we're kind of, as usual, kind of going against the, <laughs> the stream here. And we're going, going down while everyone's going up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh the the anchorages are definitely full, but I think it's more because of that. I don't really see a slowdown here. That's for sure. It, no, I will say I have a lot of uh, sailing female friends that I connect with on Facebook, and what I've heard a lot from them is that it's almost impossible to find a used boat right now. Like the same mm. thing that that you folks were seeing in the van community and the in the land nomad community, we're seeing now. With boats, it's just really hard to find used ones that are worth fixing up or they're ready to go. They just can't find them. Mm -hmm. So had you been into boating before you set sail in 2020 or what prompted, you know, this, this whole shift to begin with? Yeah. So we started sailing, I think it was around 16, 17 years ago up in Maine, which is a big coastal community in general Mm -hmm. anyway. And we yeah. loved sailing and we sailed on a, a smaller vessel, a 27 footer and then a 22 footer that we could trailer and just keep in our driveway if we weren't using it, which was great. And somewhere along the way, we just learned really early on, we wanted to do this life. We wanted to live aboard, travel around, live a more minimalist lifestyle. We've been musicians for years, you know, for decades. And we thought, you know, we can do this and travel around and make our living doing this and a few other things and not have to have nine to five jobs Mm -hmm. and two cars and a mortgage and all the things that go along with it. And I'm so glad that we made the decision to make it happen. And I think for me, the right from the right from the get go, I always had my eye on this. Um, It wasn't like a definitive plan uh, per se, but uh, when we bought our first boat, which we hadn't sailed before. We we hadn't we knew nothing. We we knew nothing. And I got on eBay and we decided we needed to buy a boat, a sailboat, and we did. Mm-hmm. And it was a blue water cruiser. Like made for being out on the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Serious um, sailing. And even though it was smaller. But I I always had my eye on, yeah, that this is this is something I want to do eventually is is to uh is move aboard and, and get rid of get rid of the house and all of all of the things we've accumulated and kind of mm. kind of be more uh, self-sustaining and our first boat we bought down in quincy massachusetts sight unseen most people when they buy a boat they have a survey done it's like a whole process to make sure it's seaworthy and stuff and mm-hmm. we were idiots and we just bought it on ebay sight unseen and then over five days we brought it back to maine with no sailing experience which is crazy as I look back on it, but it was such an amazing experience. And we learned more in those five days of sailing than we probably would have in three years of summer sailing in Maine, just because it was such a crash course and everything. Yeah. I, Luckily I mean, we survived. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't recommend doing it that way, but what I do recommend is doing it mm. and, you know, getting, getting out there and finding a way to do it. Mm-hmm. Because if, if your heart's calling you to, to do something like this man don't don't think you need big pockets you you can you can do it you know on a short budget and uh, Mm -hmm. you just need to figure out how to how to make it happen talk to people did you um did you have to uh switch you know how you made your living before you left or were you already working in ways that were conducive to to remote work that's that's interesting I think the big thing was being out from under so much debt, like mortgages, car mm-hmm. payments, uh, things like that helped out. Uh, we didn't need nine to five jobs at that point. Mm-hmm. We could make our living uh, doing what we've always kind of done on. I guess I've done it more full time, but you were more part time uh, doing music. Mm-hmm. But. I that became more of our full-time gig once we once we moved aboard. 
I, uh, my background is in engineering and, and physics, and I've always been a, um, a tutor. So what I, what I did is I started my own online tutoring business for, for math and math and physics. And that has carried us over and supplemented our income when, um, you know, during times, you know, cause in different, different times in COVID, you know, the, the gigs dried up by having, having that help us out. And, and Allison also has some side hustles. Yeah. So I spent about 20 years in broadcasting and then did a bunch of marketing positions. And so mm-hmm. I, uh, I do voiceover work remotely. So I voice commercials for people right here on the boat. And I also work part-time as a magazine editor for a magazine out in Arvada, Colorado, all remotely, you know, done. And so it's kind of nice. We can do both the tutoring and that work right here from the boat. And then if we have the music going on on top of that, we we live very comfortably. And yet we're not working full time. You know, there are sacrifices involved with that. We don't have benefits. You know, there are things that we gave up and choose to live without because we just don't feel like we need it right now. That may eventually bite us. But for right now, it's more important for us to have the freedom to be able to experience life out on the water, meeting people everywhere we go, making friends in this really unique way. It's fantastic. We love it. And we spend a lot of time staying at anchorages rather than the marinas. So that, I mean, because, I mean, if you're staying at a marina, can you explain that for, for non-boat people by like Anchorage versus marinas? I guess, um, I guess, uh, boondocking would be the analogy. Okay. So, yeah. So we're out in, um, in an area kind of off, off the channel, off the main road, so to speak, where we can safely drop an anchor, have it, you know, go on the ground we're attached with a chain to it and so we're um if you do it right it, it can i mean it's last um we've gone through hurricane force winds on our setup and it's been fine or you can choose mm-hmm. to go to a marina and spend a lot more money and be at a dock so you could drive your boat up to a dock and you can just step off onto land and some people really love that convenience a lot of times you also get showers and laundry and things like that in combination with the dock space. Mm-hmm. So that's very enticing to people, but it gets really expensive. So living the way we do and walking a mile sometimes to a laundromat or to a grocery store and things like that, it, it, it allows us to live much more cheaply. And there's a, there's a place in between there where you can pay for a mooring. Um, and what that is, is it's a, um, it's basically a permanent anchor in the ground. And usually like one of the marinas will own that and you, you pay them, you know, anywhere from 40 to $80 a night to stay on, on that mooring. And that gives you, you know, if you're not comfortable anchoring, cause not everyone is, that gives you the, the peace of mind, supposedly that you're going to, you know, wake up where you went to sleep <laughs> and but in you're usually closer to town and you usually have the the um you can use the showers at the marina and oh my god that's the big thing is finding where to take showers that's like gold <laughs> yeah because you know when you're at the <laughs> anchorage and some marinas will let you pay like you know anywhere from 12 to you know 15 bucks to come in and you can use their laundry facilities and their their showers and stuff and That might even be helpful to some folks who are um, uh, nomads by land, you know, living the van life and things like that. A lot of times marinas, you can pay 12 to $20 and have a day pass, and then you can use their laundry and their showers. Mm. And sometimes they even have a vehicle that you can use to go shopping if you, if you don't have one. Um, Oh, that's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. They don't all do that. But when, when we find one that does, it's, it's like gold. (laughs) you know, 12 bucks and we can park, park our dinghy yeah. there, a little, a little inflatable boat that we take between our house, mm-hmm. you know, our boat and land. And then we can have all those amenities. That's a really big deal. Nice. So as, um, as musicians, uh, I'm curious, 
you know, what, what instruments do you have aboard? And did you have to, uh, call the, the, the lineup for, for life at sea? <laughs> well, uh, we have a lot more than you'd expect. We're kind of in the middle of, of recording an album while, while we're doing this. And that was, that was the big thing is, um, we wanted to write all our, all of our songs we write about our experiences mm-hmm. as we as we go down and it's it's something i wanted to capture i wanted to record that so i have uh let's see we have a it, our for our live setup we have a guitar and a keyboard she plays keyboard i play guitar mm-hmm. and plus uh, our sound system yeah of course the sound stuff. system and we have one of those little you know little ones that looks like a little tower that comes up an array, Mm -hmm. you know, good for a small, small club or something. We have our live setup whittled down and purposefully bought things that were very easy to carry. Like we, I have a keyboard with a backpack case that's smaller, Mm -hmm. you know, he's got his guitar, we've got our sound system and we've got it down so that the two of us can carry it on our backs and in rolling carts as soon as we get to land to whatever gig. So as long as our gig is like a mile mm-hmm. or less from the marina that we come up to or whatever, mm-hmm. we can generally just walk to our gigs, which is really rare. And we're a little bit of a spectacle when we do it. Yeah. And well, especially when we put everything in the dinghy. So the dinghy is a, that's how we get from our big <laughs> boat to, to land when we're in the anchorages. Yeah. It's an inflatable. I know sometimes people get, you know, like a kid's toy when I say inflatable, but it's a, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't look like a flamingo or anything. No, it doesn't, but that would be (laughs) cool. I would love that. But we, so we get, we have all of our gear fits in this with us just barely, but it's, it's a big spectacle when we go through the rest of the anchorage and make our way up and people will start yelling out, where are you guys playing tonight? And we'll tell them and they're like, Oh, you know, so we we usually gather a small crowd just from going to our gigs. (laughs) But yeah, that's something people might not think about too. Is we, um, yeah, we don't have, we don't have cars, we don't have vehicles. So whenever we do a gig, we have to arrange a place to, you know, docks to park the dinghy at, and then we have to carry. We have to lug all of our stuff wherever we're going and lug it back at night. So. Once in a once in a great while, there's yeah. a, a gig that's good enough paying, and it's a little bit further away that we'll Uber to it. But that's that's a rarity. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, we just walk. And on board, in addition to that, so Galen uh, spent a lot of years, and I did some of this, but he did a lot of it working for professional theaters doing pit work. So you'd go to see a live musical, and he'd be in the pit playing the music live. He's also a drummer and a bass Mm -hmm. player and and plays banjo, a bunch of other things. And he has a full electric drum kit on board, and we've been using that for our recording project. Sweet. <laughs> so I've got video of him uh, in the middle of our boat with a whole, you know, drum set set up, which is something you don't normally see on a sailboat. Yep. And a, a bass. I got my bass. Um, and all oh, the coolest thing we just got. And this is so cliche. So forgive me for this, but I bought, I bought a ukulele and I was like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that guy, but I'm, I'm totally that guy. And so <laughs> It is so cool. It, it was like one of these Indiegogo startup things. And mm-hmm. had, it was like this modern, uh, what's it made out of? Uh, carbon uh, fiber. Carbon fiber. And it's like mint green. It's yeah, so Yeah, it's, it's so cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's most of the time at, at sunset. You'll see me out in the, in, the, um, in the back of the boat. Nice. Playing that and having a sundowner. And, yeah. Is it a close KLOS? Oh no. Ukulele? No, it isn't. But we were just on okay. a friend's uh catamaran and they had one of their guitars. Yeah. I actually I have the close travel guitar and their ukulele. I love them. Oh, oh nice. that's so cool. I would love to have their travel guitar. Yeah. I ended up buying a yeah. I went in to buy a travel guitar, or actually I went in to buy like a smaller mm-hmm. like parlor guitar. And I sat yeah. down and while I was waiting for the guy to bring back the guitar I wanted, I grabbed the guitar I have now. I played one chord on it and said, yes. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I just bought it right yep. there just because of the sound. So it's this giant dreadnought guitar. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well. But it's great for busking. So um, anybody that doesn't know, busking is when yep. you street perform. 
and just, you know, put the guitar case out there. Yeah. And we, we don't do a lot of that, but once in a while and, and it has great sound for anything acoustically mm -hmm. like that. Well, I guess the, uh, yeah, the bigger the guitar case, more money can fit in. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And it's got one of those settings where um, it, it sounds like it's being amplified, even though it isn't. Yeah, so it has, has that big, boomy, awesome sound. Yeah, it has reverb. like nice. built, And the ukulele does, too. It has reverb built into it acoustically. Hmm. So you don't need to plug it in to get huh. the reverb. So it's really cool. And the other selling point <laughs> of that ukulele is it all of the frets have different lights on it. And you can hit this thing and it puts on a light oh, show. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing in the world, but I love it so much. Sometimes the novelty is is important. <laughs> Again, if you're playing a uh, you darker, want to pick up the instrument, yeah. If you're if you're playing a darker street and busking and and hoping for some tips, they might be like, "Ooh, what's that?" <laughs> so, do you ever do live performances from the boat? Well, you know, we um, we haven't done one right off the boat, and that just is that is just because we we've been isolated so much getting down mm -hmm. getting down here. And we've just been in um, anchorages where there hasn't been a lot of people. Now that we have a lot of people around us, yeah, um, I think we're going to be doing more of that and putting up our little Venmo thing on the outside and, and just having people mm -hmm. raft up behind the boat and having a party. Yeah, and we have done a lot of online concerts from the boat, you know, during the pandemic, of course, when everybody that was a musician was playing online we did a lot of that as we were traveling yeah and our story is kind of interesting I, I won't go into the whole thing but if anybody wants to follow our story you can find us on on insta and uh, facebook and on wordpress under sail buns and we had a little bit of a harder time getting down to the southern nice temperatures than we should have wound up losing our mm -hmm. engine and going through a winter at one point with no heater 18 degrees in cape may New Jersey and, and not having a marina that would take us in. So it was kind of a crazy winter. The folks that have followed us have been like, oh, thank goodness you're down in warm temperatures and we're safe. And so we're just really relishing and being in nice conditions and looking forward to being in busy anchorages and hanging out with people. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that you you made it through. That sounds that sounds really rough. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little rough. Yeah. We, it just made us better and hardier sailors and more resourceful, I think. And we appreciate the really nice conditions better. <laughs> I'll bet. And now now that you're kind of sweating it out in, in 90 degree weather, <laughs> um, maybe you, you have fond memories of 18 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> no, no. And, and, and we are not okay. complaining about the 90 degrees, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> You know, 90 degrees yeah. isn't a, yeah. yeah, if we're stuck outside, if something happens, it's not a, we're not going to die. We just might be a little uncomfortable, but yeah, 17 degrees. Oh mm -hmm. man. No, thank you. So that's something that's kind of interesting in terms of, of tiny living that's very different on a boat. So one of the reasons we like being at anchor and being out away from land a little bit is because we get great airflow. So our boat, one of the reasons we chose it is because we have a whole bunch of windows that open up on either side of the boat and we get a tremendous breeze when we're out on the water. So we don't have to have, even in 90 degrees, we don't need air conditioning. We just open up the windows and we get a lovely cross breeze. And that's something you don't always mm. have the advantage of on land, but having that ventilation makes a huge difference. Yeah, we can, it can be in, in the 80s, um, approaching 90 and it'll be. It'll be in the seventies in here, no problem. Very and comfortable. Very comfortable. Nice. Yeah, and I I would imagine that the water too helps to cool the boat down. Oh, like yeah. the walls it, of the boat. It does up until like just in the last two weeks or so, we're suddenly in water that when you put your hand in it, it feels like bath water. We're like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, but still, the the water's seventy to seventy five during the day so i mean and if it's if it's approaching 90 that that's still cooling off the the bottom of the mm -hmm. boat but um sure. but you know on days when it does because i mean it's springtime here and it occasionally has dipped down to you know the 50s some nights i don't think it's going to do that again for a while but when that does it's it doesn't feel like i mean it's easy to keep the boat warm we, we don't we don't have to turn on the heater because we it's like a radiant heating mm -hmm. in the floor 
because the floor, you know, is still like 65, 70 degrees and just keeps that heat coming up through. So it's, uh, yeah, it's actually really nice. Nice. Mm. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Tiny House Decisions, my signature guide and the resource that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. It starts with the big decisions, which is, you know, should you build a tiny house yourself or with help? Um, is a is a pre-built shell a good idea? Is a house on wheels better than on the ground and what works better for you? Um, deciding on the overall size, deciding on whether you should use custom plans or pre-made plans, different types of trailers and more. Uh, then in, the, in part two, we get into the system. So heat, water, showers, hot water, toilets, electrical, refrigeration, ventilation. And we're only two thirds of the way through the book at this point. From systems, we go into construction decisions, talking about nails versus screws, SIPs versus stick framed versus advanced framing versus metal framing. We talk about how to construct a subfloor, sheathing, roofing materials, insulation, windows, flooring, kitchen. I know I'm just reading off the table of contents, but I just want to give you a sense of how comprehensive Tiny House Decisions is. Uh, it's a total of 170 pages. It contains tons of full color drawings, diagrams, and resources. And it really is the guide that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. Right now, I'm offering 20% off any package of tiny house decisions using the coupon code TINY when you head over to thetinyhouse.net slash THD. That's THD for tiny house decisions. Again, that's coupon code TINY when you check out at thetinyhouse.net slash THD. So um, back to the kind of question of, of making a living and, and money, do you have like a target, you know, kind of daily budget of like how much you try to spend per day or per week or per month at doing this? Or is it more just kind of dynamic and, and you just, when you need a, when you need a marina, you go for it. When you don't, you don't. I think one of the advantages to to our lifestyle is that it's not as easy as just going down to the local coffee shop and blowing 25 bucks on bear sure. claws and fancy coffees and stuff, <laughs> because we might not actually go to land for three or four days, sometimes longer. So mm. that takes some of the temptation away to blow money easily. And we're more likely to stock up on things once every couple of weeks and have a, a better idea of what we really need and what we use on a regular basis. So I think we tend to focus more on not just necessities. Like, you know, we were on land today and I bought things like sesame sticks for snacks. We don't need sesame sticks. I like sesame sticks. We just got some. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I'm also, you know, not blowing 200 bucks on groceries that we don't need. I'm, I'm kind of deciding what's good within our budget is going to be appropriate for the next couple of weeks to make sure that we have what we need and a few mm. things that we like. And it's, it's threefold. We have to be very deliberate in what we buy. Number one, budget. Mm -hmm. Number two, space, storage space on the boat. Mm. And number three, we have to, we have to transport it from the store to the, to the boat. And that can be, you know, we, we right. have two rolling carts and two backpacks and that, those carry a lot, but you know, we fill up a grocery cart. That's, you know, that's a lot of space. That's a lot of, that's a lot of space. That's a lot of lugging. Um, that's a lot of room in the, in the dinghy to bring it over here. And then once we get it here, I mean, Allison's a, a master at putting stuff. <laughs> she knows where everything is and things are hidden. Um, <laughs> in so many, and it's so funny the other night we, we hadn't, we haven't provisioned in a while. And it's like, she, pulls, <laughs> she pulls out a sitting there eating, well, she's eating something. I'm like, what, what are you eating? Pistachios. I'm like, when did we get pistachios? And it was like way back when somebody sent us some pistachios. I'm like, this is awesome. And I, I'm really good at hoarding snacks like that. So that if it's been a while since we've had a treat, I'm like, oh, I've got those pistachios that our friend Robin <laughs> sent us in a care package. This is great. I'm going to pull those out. <laughs> nice. And sometimes we'll just find stuff in like little areas and be like, oh, we got this. I and forgot I have granola. You know. <laughs> But in answer to your question, I think I tend to think of it more like a long-term budgeting. Like I know I've got this much money over the next two weeks 
And then if we can go to land and we mm -hmm. can get to a good store, then I'm thinking about, is it a store where the prices are good? Should I get more stuff because we might not find these good prices in the future or in the near future? Or should I just buy a few things because the prices aren't very good here and I should wait? So I do a lot of thought process, mm -hmm. process like that. Um, and we have to think about provisioning really differently on the boat too. Like I take the labels off of all the cans and write the, like you have like corn, beets, whatever on the top of the cans because bugs really like that moist kind of environment of a boat and you don't want bugs on your boat because it's a small space, right? So they like to lay Ooh. eggs behind the labels and also the labels can get wet and get kind of disgusting if they're stored lower in the boat. So most people who live on their boats full time, you take the labels off the cans and just use a Sharpie to mark what the can is. So I have an entire settee wow. here in the boat that's like a couch on one side of the boat. And the underneath of that has storage mm -hmm. space. And that's pretty much just lined with canned goods. Wow, that's quite a tip. And double bagging things too. Double bagging things with um, Ziplocs, which I reuse. So that um, we if there, we just we haven't had in two years we haven't had any major bug problems and I think it's because I've done those extra steps to make it so that there isn't an issue. Oh, and we, we save our uh, desiccant packs. All of those mm. like packs you get in when you order something and it says "Do not eat." Oh, those are there to absorb absorb uh, moisture, and so uh, we keep those and things like so our musical equipment will throw a bunch of those in with like our soundboard and stuff like that. So that attracts any moisture yeah. um, and keeps it away from the electronics. Things other people don't have to think about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's more about the humidification of the instruments versus the dehumidification of them. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. There's no problem with that here. No. Nope. <laughs> so. No, no. But I, I could imagine that it's it's probably good to have like that carbon fiber uke and and things that are not wood because I know that the the sea air can be quite corrosive. Yeah, and um, I have to my guitar. I have to do truss rod adjustments a lot, and I have to um, okay. buy those uh a, like a covered you know strings strings that have like a coating on them. Or they they go dead within days. Yeah, interesting. If you hear any weird noises, we have a cat. He's meowing. <laughs> oh, okay. What is what is he trying to tell you? Uh, I believe he was saying, "Give me food, Mama. Give me food. What the heck?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, speaking of your cat, uh, his name is Pickles. It's in the oh no, you you mentioned it in Pickles. Okay, and sign pickles. <laughs> yep. And did he transition from land land life to sea life, or was he like born into the the nautical existence? He made the transition, and rather well, I think. He's living his best life. He is. <laughs> yeah, now he is totally living his best life. He loves little. Um, little nooks and crannies to get into and take his many, many naps during the day. Mm -hmm. And he's still finding new places to, to go in and do that. When he goes into areas where we have things like we have a quarter berth, like a, a small bed that we use mostly for storage, like our musical instruments are in there, but someone could sleep in there if we pulled those out. When that's all full of stuff, yep. he likes to crawl in there and find places to sleep. And we call it spelunking. I'm like, did Pickles go spelunking? Where is he? <laughs> and he's never been an outdoor cat. Nice. And so we let him out, you know, out on deck anyways. And um, he, he loves that. He loves being, unless it's windy, he doesn't care for that. But he loves going out and lying in the sun and being able to, to see all the things that are, you know, outside without having to look through a window. Yeah. So he... He's really enjoying that aspect of it. And he loves if we, on the rare occasions that we do go to docks, we have to watch because he'll jump off the dock and go onto another boat in, in, in an instant. Yeah. He, he loves, um, yeah. Oh, I think that's how we're eventually going to lose. Visiting. Him. He's going to 
be a stowaway on somebody else's yep. boat. We're not someone else know will it. inherit and <laughs> yeah. some pickles and <laughs> <laughs> he'll go live his best life somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> wow. He's actually more popular than we are. You know, we're we're um we've got our social media accounts and, and such and and most of the time if we're doing a Facebook live or, or anything like that, people are, are very courteous and they listen to us about what's going on with us for about five minutes and then where's pickles? How's pickles doing? Yeah. They just really just only care about pickles. Yeah. <laughs> Even when my mother calls, she wants to see the cat. She so yeah. <laughs> oh. So what is it about the nomad lifestyle that, you know, kind of keeps you wanting more? I think for me, a lot of it is connections with people. There's something really remarkable about being in an, in an anchorage or, or even at a dock, you know, wherever you happen to be and you're around other boaters, mm -hmm. other people who have a similar mindset, they've left their houses and their full-time jobs and, and loved ones to some degree behind and they're, they're daring to live this lifestyle. When you get around other people who are like mind like that, the conversations are so much more involved so quickly. Uh, right. It's like it's not like you meet someone in your hometown and maybe you see them and have a, a few sentences with them and then you see them a few weeks later and maybe a few sentences. Mm -hmm. You might be meeting this person and you're not going to see them again or you're not going to see them again for months or a year or something like that. So connections happen really quickly and you get down to the really in-depth, meaningful conversation in yeah. a very short period of time. It's I think that's something I love. Much more intense and in-depth because, you know, it's it's a. Uh, you know, it's it's all going to be in a short time period and then you're not going to see them for quite a while and then you might run into them again. And I, yeah, I, I really love that aspect. And also for me, it was the uh, the self-sustainability, mm -hmm. being as independent as as uh, we can without having to rely on outside sources, you know, or, or I shouldn't say that, as little as possible. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we have a, we have a huge solar array and a wind generator and we have an electric, our galley, our, you know, our kitchen is all, all electric. Which is um, not the norm. Normally it's propane or something yeah, like that. So we don't have to go into town propane. with propane or anything like that. We have all, now that we're down, you know, down in the Southern climate, so we have all the power we need do whatever we, we want um yeah like with the solar and the wind that we have um i'm a huge cook and i can get up in the morning galen can make coffee i can make bread i can make lunch and dinner and I, i'm we don't have any shortage of being able to charge our devices and our phones you know all that stuff so it's um it's pretty amazing and galen designed all that himself uh, on the back of the boat, it, it's not something that came with the boat. He designed it and built it, being the engineer that he is. And I'm so glad nice. that we completely redid the wiring in this boat and put that all in so that we could just be completely self-sustained. That's fantastic. Is it? Is there a lot of 12 volt appliances like wired directly into the the batteries and solar? Yes. Um, let's see our refrigerator. So our refrigerator is. Um, one of those it's like a chest like a tailgating fridge yeah like a, a big tailgating fridge and we have it on a okay. drawer that slides out and cool that runs on a 12 volt plug-in it, it does have a it can do 120 but um that see that's 12 volt I'm trying to think all of of course all of our regular body stuff like our vhf radio that, that's all, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all i right. think everything else in the kitchen does run on regular um house current though um we have two 1800 watt inverters okay one runs just the oven and the other one runs the rest of the boat okay the and oven is amazing by the way the oven yeah the oven is a small it looks like a microwave okay and it's a microwave air fryer convection oven so it's like it's it's smaller, but I mean, wow, it's magic. I mean, she bakes, <laughs> she bakes bread in it and yeah, we can, it's, yeah, that's, that was a good purchase. And because we are on a boat, um, if you've ever seen a, a boat, uh, kitchen or galley before, um, the oven is normally on a gimbal. So it moves back and forth with the waves and mm -hmm. things stay somewhat level. 
mm-hmm. and Galen built a new gimbal so that uh, that unit that moves around with the waves has a two burner induction stove on top and that convection air fryer Ooh. combo underneath it. It's really great. There's very little I can't do. That sounds awesome. That sounds really awesome. Yeah, I've I've been, um, you know, when I built my tiny house 10 years ago, I made everything propane because I was like, I want to be able to make the house off grid. And, you know, propane is kind of the easiest solution to cutting down on your your electricity use. Um, And for a number of reasons, environmental and just environmental safety. And then also just always having problems with propane, like having enough propane, not running out of propane. Um, I've been kind of switching appliances over to electric. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's a challenge when the house wasn't built for that, you know, both in terms of how much, you know, how much juice I have, you know, how many circuits the house has and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool to hear that you are kind of bucking the the trend there and, and went with electric everything and, and you don't have to deal with gas at all. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of that had to do with not, you know, not being able to just call a, a truck to come out and fill, fill up. And even when we go into marinas, yeah. there's no propane at most marinas. So normally you have to walk half a mile or mile and mm. drag those tanks with you on a cart or something like those that. Those tanks are heavy. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah. Yeah. So I just, uh, and there's, there's been a bit of, uh, there's quite a few cruisers that have been kind of going for uh, natural gas too. Mm. Cruisers um, being people that live on their boat mm. and travel around. But now the cost of natural yeah. gas is so high that that's kind of leveling off. And I think, I think we're going to see that go away. But as, as, as uh, technology yeah. gets better and better for solar and, uh, and wind, in, in these small uh, spaces, you know, the, the energy gets more, you know, condensed and, and, and yeah. dense, um, like, you know, and lithium batteries. And as that, as that all gets more affordable and, and uh, the technology gets better and better, I, I think, I think we're going to see everything go more towards electric. And I think we're going to see, uh, eventually I would like to do an electric conversion of our engine we're not quite there yet. Uh, we still have the diesel because it uses, I mean, number one, we're a sailboat, so um, we don't have to use it a lot. We use it when we, when we want to, or when we need to, mm-hmm. but you know, at the same time, I would really like to, would really like to, uh, to convert that over, but we're just a little too heavy for that conversion. I know a lot of people have done it, but it's, not mm. not quite ready for us yet. Yeah, our boat is a little bit of a tank. It's never going to win any races, but our particular kind of boat is known for being very stable and very wide, which is great for a liveaboard. Uh huh. But uh, it does make it so that it takes a little bit more energy to move her. Yeah. Well, um, one thing that that I have in my notes, and I don't know, maybe I missed the opportunity to ask you to prepare, but. You mentioned that you'd be willing or happy to do some music during the podcast. Um, are you are you able to, or is that too much too much setup now that you're all set up the way that you are? Yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry about That's that. That's okay. I, yeah, I wish I'd known we would have. No, no, yeah. no. I, I'm sorry. I did offer, but I, um, you hadn't mentioned anything. We never want to press people to feel like they yeah. need to ask us for that. I don't mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could. could no, I guess it's a little, yeah, it's a little buried right now, but okay. if you, if you would like, we could probably send you a recording in a day or two, if that's helpful. All right. That'd be cool. Or yeah, uh, I was going to ask you if, if you had like a good farewell song if to, and to kind of like for the end of the interview, uh, uh, like a <laughs> goodbye or a traveling song of some kind. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we'll we'll have to think about that. Um, I'll bet we do. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, the wind has just picked up. So I no pressure though. I know it's really noisy right now. You can hear the halyard slapping against the the thing. We weren't supposed to, as usual. We're getting more wind than they predicted. Yep. Yep. Well, one thing that I like to ask all my guests is, what are two or three resources um, that have been helpful to you in your nomadic sailing journey 
um, that you'd like to share with with our listeners and, and resources could be books or YouTubers or really anything op- open ended. Many, yeah, many YouTubers. Um, we we've been gotten a lot of uh, a lot of good tips uh, from from watching YouTubers and especially like you know if, if I know I'm going into like um, you know on the intercoastal waterway I'm going to like Norfolk or mm-hmm. or um, the Great Dismal Swamp I'm going to look that up. I'm going to see who's who's done that and that kind of gives me the general idea of lay of the land. I could say one of our biggest resources has been the uh, that really saved us last winter was the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Mm. They um, a, a man named uh, Marty was the uh, what was his title there? Uh, he was the flotilla commander. Flotilla commander there, and he kind of uh, when we were stuck in in Cape May and we were having our, our engine issues. And, and we lost our diesel heater. And lost and, the heater. He, and it was like 20 degrees. <laughs> yeah. He really helped us out. So, you know, just emotional support and helping us uh, and giving us, you know, letting, mm-hmm. he even let us come into his house and take showers. And I mean, the guy was just amazing. Wow. But he just kind of ran as a, um, I don't know, I would you say like a liaison between us and other resources. And we were uh anchored right out in front of the coast guard station too so you know we we talked to the coast guard and the coast guard was very helpful with us uh in that situation but as far as general nice. uh general resources um there are different um like a waterway guide and in in different like apps like um aqua maps and, and navionics that um they have uh mm-hmm. like a a community that uh, I think is called Active Captain, where you you like you look at an anchorage and you click on it, and people can leave comments and um, and reviews. And nice. That that's super helpful because that that'll tell you, okay, you know, don't go to this anchorage because it's right next to the to the channel, and you're going to get rocked all morning because of the fishing boats going by. You know, there's a whole bunch of inside like, information. Inside information. But um, and the other thing is um, uh, harbor masters. Not all harbors have harbor masters, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But those that do, reach out to them when you go in. Tell them who you are, where you are. Say, hey, um, you know, just wanted to let you know we're in the anchorage. You know, out here we're going to be. You know, we're thinking of staying like a week. And tell them, tell them what you're doing, who you are, and. They want to know that. They want to know who's who's in their harbors. And they want to know that you're you're responsible and safe, and you're not just going to leave your boat mm-hmm. there. That can even be helpful if you're on land, if you if you're living on in a tiny house on wheels, because a lot of harbor masters have those showers where you can pay a small fee to go in and, and use the facilities, mm-hmm. and some of them have public parking lots where you can stay for X number of days in your vehicle too. So it's worth making a phone call if you're, especially if you're striking out in a certain area, finding resources to call a harbor master and just say, Hey, do you guys have a, a transient shower available for a small fee or, or something mm-hmm. like that? Because sometimes even if you're not on a boat, some of those resources can be available to you. Another one that I'd really recommend uh, for anybody living a tiny lifestyle, especially if you're mobile is um, something called the boat galley. Carolyn, who runs the boat galley, she's got a presence on all the major social media, and um, she is an expert at how to prepare food uh, in a small environment, how to store food in a small environment, how to keep things fresh for longer. Um, If you're if you're not going to have access to go to stores as often, she just has uh, she has an entire course that you can take online about dealing with a tiny fridge. What if you only have a tiny fridge? How can you maximize that? So the boat galley is a really great resource to look into. Nice. Well, Allie and Galen from the Sailbums, thank you so much for being guests on the show today. This was really fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to the Sailbums for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including a complete transcript, Sailbums music, Instagram, and more at thetinyhouse.net slash 217. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 217.
Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.